He said, You have been given the mysteries of God's kingdom, but those mysteries come to everyone else in parables, so that when they see, they can't see. And when they hear, they can't understand. The parable means this. The seed is God's word. The seed on the path are those who hear, but then the devil comes and steals the word from their hearts so that they won't believe and be saved. The seed on the rock are those who receive the word joyfully when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but fall away when they are tempted. As for the seed that fell among thorny plants, these are the ones who, as they go about their lives, are choked by the concerns riches, and pleasures of life, and their fruit never matures. The seed that fell on good soil are those who hear the word and commit themselves to it with a good and upright heart. Through their resolve, they bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. This morning we're continuing our three-week series of sermons that are focused on two parables that come back to back in the Gospel according to Luke. Today we're going to conclude our look at the first of the two stories, what is called the parable of the sower. And next week we're going to take a look at Jesus' telling of the story that is commonly referred to as the parable of a lamp on a stand. So last Sunday we examined the first parable through the lens of the past history of this congregation. And today, we're going to look at the same story in the context of this present moment in time. This moment we share right now in our life together. Next week, as we examine the parable of a lamp on a stand, we're going to dream together a little bit. We're going to dream going from the past to the present into the future. We're going to dream about what it is that God might have in store for this body of Christ in the days, months, and years ahead through the lens of that parable. So as we continue this study, I encourage each and every one of you to look again throughout the week ahead, not just this morning, but throughout the week ahead at these two parables that are found right next to each other in the 8th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Take a look at them on your own time. Make these readings a part of your daily devotional time and consider them in light of the memory verse that we're working on together, Luke 4, 18 and 19. As you read these at home during your devotional time and you compare them against that memory verse, I want you to ask yourself one question. And the question is this. What do these stories have in common with the mission statement that Jesus is offering in Luke 4? Something he says at the very beginning, the very start of his ministry. What do these parables have in common with that statement? My hope and prayer is that for each and every one of you, these two parables, alongside Jesus' own mission statement, will take root and be planted in your hearts and your minds. That through our conversations over the course of these three weeks, you are going to gain some new perspective on the life of this congregation, that you might be inspired, you might be inspired to sow some seeds of your own with God's help, writing the next chapter in the history of this church. To help you remain centered in the conversation, you can turn to the back of your bulletin where you're going to find the compass that guides our discussion this morning, today's scripture reading, as well as a place for you to take some notes. And I invite you to listen this morning. Listen this morning for God's voice. Open yourself to God's leading and presence stirring your heart. I hope that you hear the Spirit whispering in your ear today and that you take note of what it is that God has to say that's just for you. So every organization in the world has a mission statement. Did you know that? Every organization has a mission statement, a simple sentence or two that explains the reason that organizations exist. A good mission statement should guide the actions of an organization. A good mission statement should spell out the organization's primary goal. And a good mission statement should guide that organization's decision-making process. An effective mission statement summarizes what it is that an organization seeks to do in the world. Every organization has a mission statement. Are there any Rotarians or former Rotarians in the room this morning? Any 
Anybody ever been a part of rotary? Yeah? And do you remember by chance, Charles, the exact mission statement of the rotary in hand? All right, I'll let you do a refresher. And everybody should hear this. This is the mission statement for Rotary International to bring together business and professional leaders in order to provide humanitarian services, encourage high ethical standards in all locations, and help good, build goodwill and peace in the world. Does that sound about right to you, Charles? Okay. What about Kiwanis Club? Anybody ever been involved with Kiwanis? Yeah. Kiwanis has a mission statement, too. According to their website that I looked at yesterday, Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to changing the world, one child and one community at a time. Members of Kiwanis live out their organization's mission statement by giving primacy to the human and spiritual rather than to the material values of life. Encouraging the daily living of the golden rule in all human relationships, promoting the adoption and application of higher social, business, and professional standards, developing a more intelligent, aggressive, and serviceable citizenship, providing a practical means to form enduring friendships, to render altruistic service, and to build better communities, and cooperating in the creation and maintenance of a sound public opinion and high idealism which make possible the increase of righteousness, justice, patriotism, and good will. Are there some similarities between those two mission statements? Good will appears in both, right? There are some biblical references planted in both of those mission statements, aren't there? We have a mission statement too. We have a mission statement, too. If you turn your bulletin over to the front cover every Sunday morning, you are going to find in front of your face the mission statement of the United Methodist Church, which is what? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That is our mission statement. Now, a healthy organization will, from time to time, evaluate how well it is that they are living out their mission statement by taking a, a snapshot. They take a freeze-frame look at the work they are doing at a particular moment in time in order to identify both the things that are working well and areas that are in need of improvement. They do this so that all the work that an organization undertakes is in line with their mission. Healthy organizations do this, and that's what I'm going to invite us to do this morning. In light of the scripture reading that you just heard, the parable we're studying together, and the mission statement that Jesus himself sets out in the memory verse we're working on this month. If we take those two things and our mission statement together, how well are we as a congregation of the United Methodist Church living out our mission statement? at this particular moment in time. In the parable of the sower, Jesus lays out for the disciples a simple analysis of the mission that he has invited them to undertake with him. In this parable, Jesus identifies the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that this group is facing as they work together to achieve their mission on earth. In the business world today, what Jesus does in this parable is commonly called a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis. Uh, business leaders might be familiar with this term. It's something they pound into you in business school, being able to do a SWOT analysis. SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And the identification of these things is critical to making sure that the work of an organization is in line with its mission statement. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to take some notes if you want to very specifically. If you don't, that's okay. But I'm going to invite you to take your pen and write these letters down the side. S-W-O-T. If nothing else, you're going to learn a business term this morning. Put S-W-O-T on your bulletin. And I'm going to define these for you. And as we do our analysis this morning, I'm going to invite you to make little check marks next to each letter and see how well we're doing. I'm going to invite you to score your own congregation. You're not going to share the results with anybody, but I'm going to invite you to do that, to score your congregation this morning. The first thing, S, stands for strength. A strength is a characteristic 
that gives an organization advantage in its field. A strength is a characteristic that gives an organization an advantage in its field. The next one, W, stands for weakness. A weakness is a characteristic that puts an organization at a disadvantage relative to others. A weakness is a characteristic that puts an organization at a disadvantage relative to others. Then we move on to O. O stands for opportunity. An opportunity is something an organization can use to its advantage in achieving its mission. An opportunity is a specific thing that a particular organization can use to its own advantage to achieve its mission. That's an opportunity. And the last one, T, threats. A threat is something in the environment that might cause trouble for an organization seeking to achieve its mission in the world. A threat is something in the environment that might cause trouble for an organization seeking to achieve its mission in the world. So SWOT. You've got your four definitions. And now as we talk together a little bit, I'm going to invite you to score your congregation as we go along. We remember first that our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I put this one on your bulletin because this is critical for you to know. This is foundational to the United Methodist Church. This is our mission statement, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Nothing else. This is it. It begins here. So we're going to take a look through that lens of how we are doing it this morning. The mission that Jesus claims for himself and his disciples in Luke chapter 4 is to spread good news to the poor. To scatter seed among all people in every land and every nation. To heal brokenness. To restore sight to those who have lost their way. And to invite all who have ears to hear into the opportunity to do something. The Bible calls it repentance. Jesus calls it repent, repent, and believe the good news of the kingdom. He says over and over, repent and believe the good news of the kingdom. What does repentance mean? What does it mean to repent? To change direction, to turn, to repent. The word for repentance literally means to turn around and go in a different way. To change direction is to repent. And Christ invites all with ears to hear to change direction, to repent, to turn their hearts and their lives away from the things of the world and towards God. Now, in the parable of the sower, the different types of soil that Jesus is talking about teaches about the different kinds of people who might be encountered in the mission field. We talked a little bit about that last week, remember? The shallow soil. The soil of the scattered on the We talked a little bit about what's that, what that has meant in our history last week. But what about us? What about us right now here today? What are we doing well? What do we do well, church? What are our strengths? If we were to make a list on uh, this place where it says S, yes, what are our strengths? I sat down this week and made a list, and of these, we have a great many. We have a great many strength. This congregation, this body of Christ, is one that comes together in order to get things done. That's what you do. When something in the church is broken, there are people in this body, members with the gifts to make repairs, to supervise them, they know who to call and what to do, and in those moments, we have faith. We know those individuals will step up and offer their gifts on behalf of the kingdom to fix what needs fixing. Whenever we celebrate a funeral in God's house, whenever we have a funeral here in this place, parts of this body come together who have the gifts to care for others. And they provide food and hospitality to every single soul who passes through the door. Every time without fail. When one of our church families is in need, all the rest come together in an effort to meet that need in the most loving way possible, whether it is giving someone a ride to the doctor or having a parade of casseroles and dishes and food that come day after day to someone's home to help meet their needs in that moment. That's what we do. 
We cook spaghetti to feed a hungry football team. We host meals, fundraisers, promote fellowship and closeness to one another every month. Or sometimes we host those fundraisers to raise money for the youth group that we're cultivating in this congregation. And at Christmas time, at Christmas time, we started a new tradition last year that we're going to continue this year. At Christmas time, we decided to give generously. In just a short period of time, we raised over $2,000. In addition to our regular tithing and giving, we did more. We stepped up and gave generously to raise over $2,000 because we decided that our Savior was born and set in trough in a manger. A pile of hay in a dirty place where animals sleep. And we decided in the 21st century, that's not acceptable. In the 21st century, today, no child in Hugo, Oklahoma, we said, will spend another night without a bed to sleep in. We did that. And we're going to do it again. And over the course of this past year and a half, one of our strengths has affected my life directly. This congregation, over the last year and a half of our time together, has worked hard to make sure that a pastor and his family have been able to live comfortably, find rest, receive encouragement, and balance their responsibilities professionally, educationally, and personally. This is a tremendous gift, church. And for this particular strength, I remain profoundly grateful. This is a church that knows how to roll up our sleeves and get things done for the kingdom of God. Perhaps you can come up with more strengths. There are a great many in the life of this church now in the course of our history, but these are just a few that I've come up with this morning. You know, whenever we host an event in this church, uh, one of the goals that I have is to always uh, thank every single person who participated in making that event successful. I want to thank them for their time and their effort because they go above and beyond. They take extra time out of their busy lives to share with the community. And I don't always succeed in shaking every hand. I don't. But I do try in the moment to seek out each person that I can find and express thanks. Not just for myself, but on behalf of the whole church. That's part of the office of being a pastor. And I do this in gratitude, sincere gratitude for the work they have done at that particular moment in time. And I was talking to somebody recently after an event that we hosted in the church, and they said to me about that event, they said, you know, we just get it done. We don't think about it. We don't complain about it. We just do what needs done in this church. That is our spirit. That is a remarkable thing. But my question for you this morning is why? Why do we do the things that we do? How do they relate to our mission statement? Do we do the things that we do because that's what we were taught is an appropriate response in a particular situation? Is that one reason? Yes. Yes, it is. But there's more to it than that. That's not enough. Do we do the things we do because we recognize that our actions sometimes might foster goodwill in the larger community? Yes, sometimes. But that's not enough. There's more to it than just that. Have you ever stopped to think? Have you ever stopped to think about the seeds that you hope God is planting by every action and every word that you speak on behalf of God's kingdom and the world? Have you ever stopped to think about that? If we're living out our mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, how is it specifically, specifically, how is it that the seeds we help to scatter across this community make that happen? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Last week we talked about how it is that in previous generations, in this congregation, they were sowing seeds all the time, right? They were sowing seeds that raised up this generation to do the same thing. They planted and sowed and cultivated a garden in you. They didn't have to reach out because the world came to them at that time. All we had to do was throw open our doors on 
Sunday morning, and people would come in because that's what you did. Church was the center of the community for a long time. Sometimes we call this the era of Christendom. My friends, the era of Christendom is over. In our larger society, that time has passed. The ground has shifted beneath our feet. But those who came before us, they had a garden to cultivate. You remember that picture that was on the bulletin last week with all those faces in it and all those pews full? They had a garden to cultivate already here for them. They had you. You were their garden. And this was your inheritance. You are the harvest for the generations who have come before you. So if you think about our mission statement this morning, the question becomes, who is your harvest? Who is your harvest? Can you identify where it is that God has planted seeds in this community that we, as a congregation, have been called to harvest? I talk a lot about inviting one. Every so many weeks over the last year and a half, I've you open up your bulletin and you find a little postcard sometimes, right? And I encourage you to take that postcard and write the name of a neighbor or a friend, somebody you know who doesn't have a church home, and drop it in the mail. Give it to them when you see them at Walmart or out to lunch with a personal invitation to come to church. I do that so that those people might be inspired, seeds might be planted in their hearts, that one day they might come six days from now, six months from now, six years from now, and celebrate the presence of God in our lives right next to you at your invitation. I do this so that you might have an opportunity to cultivate new relationships that plant seeds for God's harvest. This has not proved to be an easy road to hoe, has it? The seeds that were planted and cultivated in you as you have been made disciples by those who came before you and the grace of God have transformed your world. So we find in this day and time, transforming the world functions a little differently, doesn't it? The seeds that have been planted in you, you need to remember this, they've gone further than just transforming your world. They have transformed the world. The seeds that were planted in you transform the world. Your children, your grandchildren, all of the people that you have had an opportunity to meet and bless throughout the course of your life have been transformed in some way by having the opportunity to know you as people. What about in the life of this church? The harvest is wonderful, Jesus says. What comes after that? But the workers are few. In everything that we do, at every administrative meeting, in every hour of worship, in every small group gathering, in every fellowship dinner, in every funeral reception or community event, there is a reason why we are called to do what we do. Not just because it needs fixed or it needs done. There's more to it than that. We're called to plant seeds. We're called to scatter seeds. We're called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So church, how are we tending the garden that God has put before us? This, I articulate, is a weakness for us. This is a weakness for us. Our ability to articulate and clearly measure the desired result that God has for our service against the actual outcome of the things that we do is something that together we need to work on. Some people have said to me in my time here, they've said, well, you know, preacher, we try all kinds of things, but nothing ever seems to work. Heard that one before? Others have said, well, they just don't come like they used to anymore. And we say these things one to another, and you know what happens? We lose heart. We get discouraged sometimes when we say these things to each other. One way to read the parable of the sower is to identify the weaknesses 
in the soils that Jesus describes, chalk them up as lost causes, and then focus exclusively and entirely and only on the good soil. That's one way to do it. And if you read the parable that way, what you're going to say is, I don't need to worry about the rest of that because it didn't work out. Because I've tried that before, and it didn't work. I have invited people with a postcard, and they didn't come. All of my neighbors go to church already. Everybody I know has a church family, or my kids moved away. So I'm going to focus on the people already here. I'm going to love them harder. I'm going to raise them up more. I'm going to bless them more richly. I'm going to care for the garden that's already here, and I'm going to ignore the field outside the building. Here's the risk. Here's the risk. When we do this, we become insulated. We become isolated from the places that God has called us to scatter seed. Christ never built a church to throw seed in. He never did that. The disciples never built a church to throw all their seed in. That's not what they did. And in the history of the United Methodist Church, in the 100-year period where we were building a church every single day of the year, 365 churches a year we were building, we never built a building to throw seed in. We can tend this place. We can do that. We can create in this place a very beautiful plot, a gorgeous garden with amazing flowers, rich and strong and beautiful, that lives alone in the midst of barren, dried up fields. And when we do, we leave all that other seed unattended. And Jesus says, where the harvest is plentiful, the workers will I want you to turn up your bolt in the front cover. Look at the front cover of your bolt right now. This picture was taken two Sundays ago during worship. Look at this picture and what do you see? How is the harvest? Now put your bolt in now and look back. Look at me. That's one way to read this parable. But there's another way. There is another way to understand God's story, to recognize our story in God's story that should not leave us with despair. There is another way to read this story. When Jesus shared this parable with his disciples, they asked him what it meant. See, at this time in Jesus' ministry, he had been thrown out of the synagogues. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the day were stacked against him. He was a pariah among the thought leaders of his day. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus and his little band of followers. He and the disciples had a tough road to home. Jesus told this parable as a counsel to his disciples against despair. A counsel against despair. Despair. Jesus doesn't offer the story in an effort to confuse anybody in his larger audience. He offers the story to strengthen the workers that he is cultivating. See, every farmer knows that some of his seed is going to get lost. It can't all grow. But that doesn't discourage him or make him stop sowing. Because a smart farmer knows that in spite of those setbacks, the harvest, be sure. We're going to have sacrifices. We're going to have discouragements. We're going to try thing after thing after thing that doesn't always work. Jesus tells us that. We're going to have enemies and opponents, Jesus tells us, but never despair, church. Never despair, because in the end, Jesus tells us one thing. Be sure. The harvest is Sure. This parable is an encouragement for us. A reminder that we should banish despair and all of those thoughts. Of, well, we tried it and it didn't work. We need to put those out of our mind and move forward certain that there is nothing, nothing in this world that can defeat God's ultimate harvest. Not here in Hugo, Oklahoma. 
not anywhere else in the kingdom of God. So Jesus reminds us in this parable to never stop working. Never stop sowing. Never stop inviting. Never stop making disciples. Because in the end, God's purpose, God's mission statement for your life, the transformation of the world, is sure. This is an opportunity for us to really step back and think about why it is that we do what we do. To think more deeply and more spiritually about how our words and actions might bring about a harvest in a different way than it did for those who came before us. It's going to look different now. To understand the things that we do well, to recognize our strengths and be able to articulate them, and then to position ourselves to do them even better by living out the why that we do them. The why is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's an opportunity. Sometimes we draw comfort from looking at other churches here in our community. We say to each other, well, you know what? They're not doing any better than we are. Their numbers are falling too. So it's all right. We're all in the same bed together. Sometimes we compare the work that we do to other congregations and we think to ourselves that they're more successful than we are. Turn your bullets over to the back one more time. Now look down near the bottom. Look down near the bottom and look at the two columns on the bottom of your page. See what is written there at the bottom. Look at the letters in red. 4,070 people. 4,070 people live within one mile of our congregation. A conservative estimate says that 40% of them have no church home. 40% of 4,070 people have no church home. That's 1,628 disciples Jesus is calling us to make the church. 1,628 disciples Jesus is calling us to make. What would happen in the kingdom of God right here if you go home? If 3%, 3%, 49, 49 people join this congregation. What would happen to us as stewards of God's kingdom? Would we reap a new harvest? Can we do that? Yes, we can. See, our biggest threat to achieving the mission of the United Methodist Church, the mission that God has put before us, is not other churches. Don't compare yourself to other churches. Don't do that. We call that in this line of work sheep stealing. And we're not sheep busters. Don't compare yourselves to other churches. Either to feel better or feel worse. Don't do that. See, our biggest threat is us. Our biggest threat is us. Our own entrenchment sometimes to the way we like things done is our biggest threat. Our own memories of the glory days gone by is a threat sometimes. But our best days are not behind us. Turn over your bolts one more time and look at that. Look at that picture on the front, and what do you see? I see open places. I see open places. I see spots in the garden just waiting to be filled with new life. I look at that picture, and that's what I see. Places for new life to be planted. Life that we can love because we're good at that. Life that we can nurture because we're good at that. Life that we can teach and encourage because we're good at that. And life that will grow because we are good at that. That is our strength, church. That is what we have been made for. That is what Jesus has called us and equipped us to do. To plant, to sow, to cultivate, to make disciples, and to reap the harvest to transform the world. Some might look at that picture and say that the workers are few. I would look at that picture and say that the soil is good and the harvest is sure. Will we resolve, church? Will we resolve, as Jesus invites at the end of this parable, to bear new fruit? Amen. And on that, I'm going to invite you to remain standing for the benediction. Bear in mind this: last week we took a look, didn't we? We took a look at.
and where we have been in the history of the garden that has grown in this congregation. Today we took a look at where we are right now. Where are we going? Where are we going now? Where will the seeds that we scatter today as we leave this place lead us tomorrow? How can we scatter more effectively, more intentionally with every word and action from this moment forward? In the week ahead, my prayer for each and every one of you is that these conversations and the scriptures we are studying in Luke's gospel will bear fruit, much fruit in your life. That you will go from this place right now with the eye of a sword. That you will go to scatter good news to the poor. That God will use your hands this week to loose the bonds of captivity that surround so many in our community today. I pray that God will use your witness to restore sight to someone whose own pain and despair and trouble may have blinded them from seeing how much it is that they are loved by the God in whose image they too were made. And I pray that God will stir your spirit to dream a new dream. To dream a dream that might even seem a little crazy at first. The dream of a magnificent harvest for the kingdom of God in Hugo, Oklahoma. So that when we come together again next week, for this, our time of fellowship and praise, God will have prepared you to proclaim a new beginning to the year of His faith. May it be so in your lives and in the lives of all who need. Amen. And amen.